to put us in the right mind to start this day. We know that we've always called on the spirits, we've always called on God, we've always called on a higher being to set us straight on a daily basis. And we're very pleased this morning to do just that by having one of our own, uh, one of our social justice leaders in our community, one of our young pastors in our community, who pastors almost one of the oldest churches in our community, BB uh, Memorial, one who you can listen to every Sunday morning waking us up on KBLX, a person who gives back to our community, none other than Reverend Charlie Haynes, Jr. If we can, wherever we are in the room, let us bow our heads. God, again, we thank you for this day. We thank you, O oh God, that you have set us aside as African-American organizations all coming together under one roof under Laney College. We thank you, O oh God, for the visionary and the vision of Keith Carson. And we pray, O oh God, that today will be a day of impact that today will be a day that we transform community, that all of these organizations come together as one heart and one voice and one breath. Now, God, we ask that you sanctify the conversations and the panelists and the information that we shall receive, that we will leave here today not the same, but inspired. So, God, we ask that you bless it right now. We ask that you have your way in this day, that we have healthy and positive conversations, that we will work together and not compete against each other. In the name of God, we pray today and believe it's already done. Let every heart say amen. Thank you, Pastor Haynes. So make sure tomorrow morning that you turn your dial on KBLX and listen to the gospel music that is being provided by B.B. Memorial and Dr. Reverend Haynes. We are in the house, we're in the house of Peralta Community College. The appropriate place to be, education, a key part of our foundation. We're in the house of Laney College. We're in the house of Laney College and to do appropriate welcoming this morning. We're gonna have none other than the chancellor. To many of us, he's the new chancellor, but for some of us, we've already been in a number of meetings with him around education. He's already started to immense himself, emerge himself into our community and making sure that education is on our mind. To welcome us to his house, Dr. Jose Hortez, who is the chancellor of the Peralta Community College District. Thank you, Keith. Good morning, everyone. Actually, um, I may be the new chancellor, but I'm not new to Peralta. I was the uh, vice president at Laney College 10 years ago. Some of you may remember me. I even had hair at that time. But one of the reasons I came back to Peralta and certainly to the East Bay area because of this, of our diversity, our ethnicity, diversity of ideas, progressive thought. And I find it very interesting that as we, we commemorate 150 years of the Emancipation Proclamation, we, I hope you know that. 150 years of the Emancipation Proclamation. We are still, quite frankly, struggling and are challenged by issues of equality, opportunity, and as uh, Supervisor Carson just said, opportunities in education. Recently, I was talking with Shakti Butler. I don't know how many of you know Dr. Butler. She recently uh, produced Cracking the Code. 
and we had a, a wonderful discussion about race. And what I came away with was for us to come to terms with race, we must have the dialogue. We must continue the dialogue and be able to talk straight up about what it means to be black, African-American, what it means to be brown or Latino, what it means to be Asian, whatever we are, our ethnicity, we must be able to talk about it. And I want to commend Supervisor Carson, our panelists, certainly Congresswoman Robert Lee, who I saw walk in, there she is, for bringing us together today. And unfortunately, I can't be here all day because as chancellor, they got me running around all over town. But this morning, I want to welcome you all. I want to thank you for being here. And I want you to continue the dialogue. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Again, to welcome us to their house is someone who really doesn't need an introduction. Dr. Eleanor Webb is a president of Laney College, but we see her all in our community, everywhere in our community, engaged, not just around the area of education, but really making sure that we connect all the dots that affect each and every one of us on a daily basis. So without any further ado, I'd like to welcome uh, to the stage, Dr. Eleanor Webb, president of Laney College. It's an honor. Keith Carson loves this community, doesn't he? Keith Carson gets this community, doesn't he? Keith Carson represents this community, doesn't he? Keith Carson had this vision for us to come together and share the resources of this extraordinarily rich community. And I do mean to emphasize rich community not only in terms of the diversity of people that our chancellor referenced, not only in terms of the diversity of resources, but really the nature of what's in our minds, what's in our heart. When we share what's in our minds, what's in our heart, we can help transform this community overnight. We are the solutions we're looking for. And I wanna thank you for choosing to recognize Laney is your college. It's our college, it's a community asset, and that's why we're in this space. I also wanna more importantly thank you for recognizing that we are each other's keepers. We are each other's resource. And the degree to which we are healthy is a reflection of the so-called least among us being healthy. The degree to which one of us is in jail means that we're all in jail. Let's be clear, when one of us doesn't have the necessary basic resources, none of us really do. We cannot walk around with the illusion that somehow we're great because of our, what we have in our pocket what we have in our homes when someone in this community is homeless. We have a lot of students who attend Laney who are homeless and they find hope. That hope is found because someone chooses to look at them in the eyes and say, I believe in you. I believe in your capacity. I believe in your ability to make a difference now, not 10 years from now, and I wanna facilitate that. And by coming together as African-American organizations, you get it. You understand that. And by coming together as members who are civically engaged, who are activists, who are CEOs of organizations, who are elected officials, you get that we're the solutions that we're looking for. So without further ado, let's move forward. And Congresswoman Barbara Lee, thank you for caring in ways that's invaluable and choosing to take the hits even at the national and international level to say what's right is what I stand for. What I stand for is equity and justice. Without further ado, it's an honor. Dr. Elnora Webb, president of Laney College. I want to thank all of you for being with us this morning. And this will be a day of information, but more so a day of action. A day of action. No more talking, but action. And to start it off right now, 
I'm going to introduce our first opening panel. And the moderator for that panel is a person who has been an educator in our community, has been an activist in our community, has been a leader in our community, none other than Greg Hodge. Good morning. Thank you, uh, Brother Carson and to the Laney family in Oakland. Uh, my name is Greg Hodge, and we're going to have a wonderful panel this morning, and we're going to move right into it. Um, I want to introduce um, two pe three people who are here in the room and one who will be joining us in a moment. First, uh, Jakarta Imani, who is the executive director of Ella Baker Center. Please welcome him as he comes to the stage. Come on, y'all, a little bit. Yeah. Second, uh, one of the founders and leaders of the Black Panther Party. Doesn't need an introduction in this community, but we welcome him, Brother Bobby Seale. And he's coming, they get the photo op. <laughs> Brother Seal, as he's come. And uh, the first person we're going to hear from uh, this morning, who has been uh, a fearless champion for us in Washington and all over the world as she travels representing the interests of our community. She's someone who uh, John Henry Clark would appreciate as a leader because she understands power. Dr. Clark taught us that history is a clock that people use to tell their political and cultural time of day, a compass that people use to find themselves on the map of human geography. And our congressperson, uh, with no further ado, we're going to ask her to begin our conversation about where have we been, where are we headed. And we're going to really focus on that where are we headed part uh, today. But please welcome Congresswoman Barbara Lee. And, and good morning. First, let me thank Greg for your consistent and, and constant leadership in this community on behalf of so many issues, but especially on behalf of our children. Let me also take a moment to thank my good friend and colleague, Supervisor Keith Carson, who has stayed the course, stayed the course, and also, I have to just thank uh, Chancellor Ortiz and Dr. Webb for continuing to ensure that we have a future here in our community and that Peralta continues to be the most outstanding community college district in the country. And I can attest to that. So I have to thank them and thank you. Also, and as we start out, and I won't be uh, very long because, you know, I'm doing my district work today, but it's so good to be with you. Uh, I just have to say that uh, I was at the first Making Connections Forum in 2010, and Keith, I, wherever Keith is, I'm so glad you're, you're continuing to do this, because it, it is so important that in black, during Black History Month, African Americans have a forum to come together to not only make connections, but to look at where we have been, where we are, and where we need to go in the future. And so this is really a tremendous moment for us. Let me just say where we have been in this community is where I just want to start. And I have to acknowledge my comrade, Bobby Seal, because that's where we've been. The Black Panther Party really paved the way for myself and so many of us to become elected officials. I'll always remember Bobby running for mayor of Oakland. The Black Panther Party, Bobby Seale, Elaine Brown, paved the way for Lionel Wilson, for Elihu Harris, for Gene Kwan, Ron Dellums, paved the way for myself. And I know, you know, this was, you know, during the late 60s and the 70s. And we're marking this year the 50th anniversary of the Great March on Washington. And Dr. King, our great warrior for peace and justice, his I Have a Dream speech. And also the 150th anniversary of the Emancipation Proclamation. But here in the Bay Area, we must never forget the revolutionary movement of the Black Panther Party, who really set the stage for institutional and structural change. Now, I was a community member. Yeah, yeah give, you know, I'm going to talk about, because Bobby and Elaine will talk about the party, but as, as a member of Congress who benefited and learned from the Black Panther Party, I just have to share for a minute where we were then and what I saw and, and helped work on. First of all, 
the free breakfast program for children. Free breakfast program. And guess what? Now we have breakfast programs sponsored by the Department of Education and the Department of Agriculture. That never would have happened had we not paved the way here for that. George Jackson Medical Clinic. You know where the concept of community clinics came from that are now a national standard or provide the national standard for health care? From the Black Panther Party. George Jackson Medical Center. Community Learning Center. Smaller schools, alternative education for our young African-American children. You know where that movement was started? It was started right here in Oakland by the Black Panther Party. Now everyone wants to have the type of education that the party was standing for and worked for in the day. When you look at voter registration drives, and you know how hard it's been over the years to wake our people up and, and, understand, and help people understand in the black community why voter registration, voter empowerment is essential. Well, I can tell you one thing. I remember the Black Panther Party and their voter registration efforts, and that's how I learned to do grassroots politicking, and that was voter registration, knocking on doors, precinct work. It started here with the Black Panther Party. It started here. I got involved in politics in the day, in the early 70s, and I worked with Congresswoman Shirley Chisholm. I had never registered to vote. She convinced me that as a revolutionary and someone who wanted to change the world, I should register to vote. And so I got involved in the Shirley Chisholm campaign, but guess what? The Black Panther Party did also. And they engaged in a massive voter registration effort where here in Alameda County, we took almost eight to 10% of the vote for Shirley Chisholm for president. And now Barack Obama is president, paved the way, paved the way. And so I'm sharing this because when we look now at the incarceration rates of African-American and Latino young men who worked on prison projects and raised the level of awareness about in incarceration rates, this prison industrial complex, this cradle to the prison pipeline, who raised those issues? It was the Black Panther Party. And so I'm sharing this, and I could go on and on about this because what I'm dealing with in Congress today has to do with all of the issues that we've been fighting for here in this community for decades. And we made a lot of progress because of what you all in this community have put together over the years in terms of staying strong as the most progressive congressional district in the country. And yes, you are that. And, and so moving forward now to where we are, you know, I served as chair of the Congressional Black Caucus during the first two years that President Obama was president. And I tell you one thing, in the Affordable Care Act, in education policy, in voter protection, voter empowerment, and each and every issue that we've been dealing with here in the Bay Area with the Black Panther Party and many of you, we were able to champion in Congress. And the Congressional Black Caucus, 42 members strong, continues to be the voice of conscience for the African American community, communities of color, poor and low income communities around the country. And the fights are very, very serious right now. The, and I'll just end by saying, what I'm an appropriator. I'm on the Appropriations Committee. I'm the only African-American woman on the Appropriations Committee that decides where your resource is going to go, OK? And I'm on the Budget Committee. The fight that we have as a community is to develop our funding priorities. Are we going to continue to fund building prisons or building schools? building schools. So I have to fight that fight on the Appropriations Committee. Are we going to continue to fight to build houses and create jobs or continue to build bombs and missiles? So we have to fight to reduce the military budget, which it can happen. And we've got to fight to end this war. This is where the anti-war movement started. So we have to re-engage in our movement for peace, and for justice. And that's what you all, and that's what the 13th Congressional District, and that's what the Bay Area has, has led on. And so we can't, during Black History Month, forget our roots. We can't forget who we are as a progressive, committed community. The black community has always been out there leading the way. 
People oftentimes ask me, how do I deal with this madness? And why would anyone run for office given the lack of civility? Now I gotta tell you, as tough as politics is, and Keith knows how hard it is for me, for him, as difficult as it is to get up each and every day to fight these battles, as an African-American progressive woman, as tiring sometimes as it gets, going back and forth, Oakland to Washington, Washington to Oakland, each and every week, okay? With no personal time and having to make many personal sacrifices, there must be a resistance movement in the United States Congress. There must be, there must be. And so you give me that strength to do this, to fight this right-wing agenda, which you know, Bobby knows, Keith knows, it didn't just start a few years ago. And I'm constantly reminded, and especially now during Black History Month, that our forefathers and mothers who were brought here in chains, they lived as slaves under inhumane conditions for hundreds of years. Jim Crow and segregation followed. Our ancestors fought back, and here we stand today. So take that baton and let's move forward. Thank you again. God bless. Where is Elaine? Where is Elaine? Where is, where is Elaine? Huh? Elaine. No, I've got to go. But let me just say, uh, Elaine was, when I mentioned Bobby running for mayor, Elaine Brown, who's, thank goodness, with us here back in Oakland, they ran for city council and paved the way for so many of our African-American members now of the city council to be where they were. And so we owe Elaine Brown and Bobby Seale a real debt of gratitude. Thank you very much. We want to thank our congressperson one more time for Barbara Lee. Give her a round of applause. She's going to have to take off here in a second. So as we move forward, we want to hear from uh, Jakarta Imani. He's the executive director of the Ella Baker Center for Human Rights. Uh, that organization has worked on a range of issues in terms of prison pipeline, environmental issues, and uh, safety and uh, stopping the violence here on the streets of Oakland. So I'm going to ask Jakarta, just for a few minutes, your perspective on uh, where we've been, uh, where we are, and where we're headed. Please give Jakarta Imani another round of applause, if you would. Good morning, good morning. Uh, I'm not exactly sure how I ended up on this illustrious panel, um, but I'm gonna try to do the best to hold up my end. Um, I, I'm gonna, so where we been? Um, I grew up during the height of the war on drugs in this city. Um, and what I remember was hearing these stories from my mother about the Black Panther Party and about uh, the movement in the Bay Area. But what I grew up experiencing was that some of my elders were afraid of me. Um, what I grew up experiencing was going to community meeting, meetings where some of my elders would talk about, could the police arrest young black men for loitering in front of their own homes because they were afraid of us? So what I grew up with was also knowing that I was a part of a community um, where people would see me out in the street, some of my elders, and say to me, uh, what are you doing over here? Does your mother know you over here? You better hurry up and get your butt home. And I'd get home, my mom would say, Miss so-and-so saw you over in such and such place. Who said you would go over there? So I grew up with this dual consciousness, one being a part of a community that took care of me, and I grew up in a, later in life as a part of a community that was beginning to fall apart, where people didn't know each other, where people were worried about um, what somebody else's grandchildren were gonna do to them. Um, and so I grew up with this sense of a fractured city and, and, and a fractured community where we were beginning to lose unity, right? And the war on drugs, I think, made it worse. Uh, crack caused our community a ton of problems, but the war on drugs made every element of it 8,000 times worse. It made the drug trade more violent, more profitable, destroyed our community in ways that we're still recovering from. And so for me, you know, um, that's where, that's, 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 that's part of the recent past of how I grew up. Uh, where we are now is, we're at an interesting moment because they're, 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 we've gone through this huge economic crisis um, and 
We didn't really change the economy, though. The, the main state of the debate around this economic crisis was, were we going to bail out banks or were we going to bail out homeowners? And while I'm all for save, helping people save their homes, and I think we should do everything we can to save people's homes, if we had bailed out homeowners, the money would have went to the banks. It would have stopped in people's checking accounts and then right went on to the banks. That's not reorganizing our economy. That's not putting our economy back in the hands of working people. That's not putting our economy in the hands, taking our economy away from the hands of corporations who are trying to heat up the planet and buy elections. And so we're at a moment now where we really need to reorganize our economy such that it's in the hands of people and not in the hands of corporate interests. And so that's, 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 a, that's a tipping point. One of the other things is I believe we're beginning to, as a community, as black people, come to consciousness about the impact of the war on drugs in our community. And not just seeing it as like the question about, you know, what were you doing standing on the corner? Why were you outside? Why were you kicking it on the street? But really understanding it as we understand education. We have a public safety system that is failing. Oh, oh, a better mic. Um, we have a public safety system that is failing our children. We have a public safety apparatus that's not designed to increase safety in our communities, but designed to sweep up our children into a prison industrial complex and make profit off of them. That sounds like y'all, no, just uncomfortable? No, <laughs> we're uncomfortable with this conversation? All right, I'm gonna keep going then, I'm onto something. Um, so we're at a tipping point. Um, and I think that we can turn it around. I think that, that you're beginning to see with the, uh, uh, Michelle Alexander's book, with what the Congresswoman talked about, that there is a, a, a movement afoot to actually do something about ending the new Jim Crow, which is this prison industrial complex, in a way that actually strengthens our community and reinvests those billions of dollars that are being invested in incarceration and locking up our communities into educating our communities, lifting up our communities. There's also something happening in terms of um, cooperative economics and people, um, whether it's Mandela Food Co-op in West Oakland or it's some of the shareable economy or people are getting together and doing these time banks, there is a new economy bubbling up underneath. Um, and so I think where we're going though is I, I think where we have to go is a place where we can figure out how to make multiracial, multi-class alliances as black people. So, we, and, and, and we, we have a moment where the other communities of color are stepping up. And, and the lie that we've been told about Latinos is that they don't like us and that they're racist. And the lie that they've been told about us is that we don't like them and we're dangerous, right? And so that's meant that um, we be fighting over crumbs lots of different places and not working together to govern our communities collectively. And so I think the future is in not in some sort of like um, pretend fake kumbaya diversity, but in real hardcore discussions about what are the interests of black people in this city, in this state, and in this country? What are the interests of Latino uh, immigrants and US citizens in this city, in this state, and in this country? What are the interests of um, Southeast Asian and Asian and Pacific Islander folks in this city, in this state, and in this country? And how are we gonna come together to actually govern this city, this state, and this country as a majority. Thank you. All right, thank you, Jakarta. Next, I want to hear from, uh, as we've introduced him, one of our um, leaders in this community for years. He's an author, he's a founding member of the Black Panther Party, again, Bobby Seale. Why do I have this feedback? Yeah, they're working on it. They're working on it. What about that mic over there? No, this is the one. This is, yeah, this is, this is. I can't sit down. <laughs> yeah, never sat down. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, wow. 
nice crowd. I like it. I've been in a lot of colleges and a lot of universities, but this particular event here in this community, Oakland, California, San Francisco, Oakland Bay Area, Alameda County, is very, very important because, as they've already noted to you, when uh, I founded the Black Panther Party, Huey P. Newton and I wrote the 10-point platform and program. I was actually employed by the Department of Human Resources, city government of Oakland at the time. Mm. Uh, I worked in the North Oakland neighborhood. I worked in the North Oakland Neighborhood Service Center, and as a community liaison, and I also supervised all the youth jobs and the youth summer youth jobs programs there. Uh, at another point, when Huey Newton needed extra money, he was in night law school at the time. I hired Huey, so I supervised Huey Newton there as an assistant with me at the North Oakland Neighborhood Service Center for about a year in that period when we created the Black Panther Party. So me, I was already doing programs uh, before the Black Panther Party ever existed. I mean, the North Oakland Neighborhood, the, the North Richmond tutorial program, I was part of the creation and the development of that whole program. Uh, you can go online and find a proclamation that the city government of Richmond gave me for creating the first youth jobs program in North Richmond, California, 1964. So I'm saying this was my background. Prior to that, I mean, historically, I mean, the counterintelligence program, Ronald Reagan, the governor, they called me a hoodlum mm -hmm. when I first led a delegation to the California State Legislature. But I resented that very much so because I was nobody's hoodlum. I mean, prior to even getting into the whole civil human rights protest movement, I was at Kaiser Aerospace and Electronics out on Doolittle Drive over in San Leandro, just outside of Oakland. And there, I worked in the engineering department. I mean, they called me a hoodlum, but I was doing electromagnetic field black light non-destruct testing for all engine frames with the Gemini missile program. Ooh. Xylo non-destruct testing for all three stages of exhaust housing for the Gemini missile program. Right. Yes. So, this, this, this is the killer. You see what I'm getting at? When we created the Black Panther Party, Huey was two years into law school. And we were students, and we were avid readers, and we researched. But me, I love putting programs together. And it came from my background. My father is a master carpenter and builder. My grandpa on my father's side was a master carpenter and builder. There's a little town east of Jasper, Texas. Jasper, Texas is where Bird was drugged to death some 10, 11 years ago. Bird, the young black man who was drugged to death by racists, was fourth cousin to my family because both my mother and father were born in Jasper, Texas, just this side of the Louisiana border. But nearer to the Louisiana border is a town called Weirgate, Texas. And that's where my grandpa was the main contractor for building over a thousand homes in that community connected with some oil shale development that was going on at the time. So I'm trying to show you my background and I don't like and resent it to this day, the politicians, the races and the others and all of the whoever's that want to say we were hoodlums, we were thugs, etc. Now, me and my director producer, he's here with me, former Black Panther Party member also, but you know, graduated to UCLA as a master's degree as a filmmaker. We're putting a film together. And this film is about my life story, but my life story is really the bulk of this film about my organization, the Black Panther Party. And I started I start this film off, we were writing the screenplay. I start this film off 
and the great Chicago 7 conspiracy trial. A trial, if you know anything about the history, and some of the young folks need to still know, that they put me into, the power structure charged, falsely charged me and wrongfully charged me with conspiracy to try to incite riots, they say, at the 1968 Democratic Convention. But this is where I start this film. And it's about them, the power structure, at that time, moving to destroy, moving to destroy, excuse me, my organization, the Black Panther Party. In 1968, November, Richard M. Nixon was elected to office. A week later after he was elected in November, he had not been sworn in yet, he had a meeting with J. Edgar Hoover. In the first week of December, before Nixon was even sworn in, J. Edgar Hoover was on the national television saying that the Black Panther Party was a threat to the internal security of America. It would be four months later that J. Edgar Hoover is back on television, back on television, saying the Black Panther Party's free breakfast for children program is a threat to the internal security of America. Now, what I'm trying to show you here is that here is a right-wing racist power structure, the head law enforcement framework of the United States of America and around the world setting up an operation to attack us, to destroy us, etc. This is what they're doing. Immediately after J. Edgar Hoover said in December 1968 that we're, the, we was a threat to security in America, what was it, two weeks later, I had a retreat of party members to come up, lead, lead, leadership people out of each chapter and branch to come in. The main thing I dealt with that retreat was telling party members, Elmer Geronimo Pratt and others, I want all Black Panther Party officers across the country. By this time, we had 49 chapters and branches throughout the United States of America by this time, 1968. You have to imagine, in the early part of 1968, before Dr. Martin Luther King was killed, we only had 400 members up and down the West Coast, from Seattle to San Diego. That's all we had. But when they killed and murdered Dr. Martin Luther King, young brothers and sisters and people, especially when exams was over, flooded to our organization. All across country, I mean, Fred Hampton and Bobby Rush, now Congressman Bobby Rush, flew on a plane to come out to talk to us about starting the Chicago chapter, Philadelphia, et cetera. So by the end of the year, we had 5,000 members in 49 chapters and branches throughout the United States of America, complete with every chapter having a free breakfast for children program, every chapter also having a free sickle cell anemia testing program. I mean, these are the programs. It is the breakfast programs. It is the free preventative medical health care clinics. It is the sickle cell anemia testing programs. Those became the most popular programs. But those young brothers and sisters with my instruction, because I went to every chapter and every branch to teach Black Panther Party members to find particulars in the methodology of effective grassroots community organizing. This is what I told them. The very demographics, the methodology of setting up and knowing and understanding how to get to the voting precincts, finding out and registering people to vote, because it's about unifying the people electorally, I was telling them, to get that unity going on in our community on a broad, profound scale. Because to me and Huey, before the party was started, our analysis were basically plain and simple and to the point. We understood institutionalized racism in its most profound sense. But the crux of it were the laws. And who makes the laws? Legislative bodies, whether they're city council legislative bodies, county seat supervisorial legislative bodies, of state legislation, federal, they make laws, they make rules. And when you read Leon Higginbotham, if you know who Leon Higginbotham is, Leon Higginbotham is a circuit court justice out of the Third Circuit Court District in Philadelphia. But he was a very great prolific writer about our civil rights and human rights. And he's a circuit court justice. And the last book he wrote was Shadows of Freedom. And in Shadows of Freedom, he details for you a chronology 
from the beginning of this country right on up to the present when he finished writing this book here 20, 15, 20 years ago. I mean, he details for you the chronology of how laws was constructed all across this country based on two factors, two interconnected, interrelated factors. The precept of white supremacy and the precept of black inferiority. This is the basis of how laws are structured throughout the United States. And this is where Huey P. Newton and I were coming just before we even created the Black Panther Party. That if Rosa Parks is forced to move to the back of the bus, we're talking about a legislative law that said so. There were thousands of these kind of discriminatory laws of all kinds, et cetera. So it's those racist laws that have to be changed. When we started in the 1960s, not only myself, SNCC, I mean, I have a lot of praise for everything at SCLC and Dr. King and others, whoever, et cetera. But in those mid-60s, early 60s, mid-60s, there were less, listen to me, brothers and sisters, there were less than 50 duly elected African-American or people of color even elected to political office throughout the whole of the United States of America. Well, me, I love math, you know what I mean? And I sit down and proceeded to count all the counties in every state throughout the United States of America. Took a glance and a look at all the city council seats that you could be elected to, et cetera. And I came up with more than 500 thousand political seats that people could be elected to throughout the United States of America. And in that period, we were less than 50. We were less than 50 in terms of people of color in the African American community. We were less than that in the middle of the 60s. And that 60s protest movement that we in the Black Panther Party was part and parcel of, interconnected with, worked with, had great coalition politics because we crossed every ethnic line, every whatever line, every organizational line. We work with everybody. We work with SCLC and the Poor People's March. Before Dr. King was killed, Dr. Reverend Ralph Abernathy called me personally. He says, Mr. Seal, I'm calling you on Dr. Capacity, Dr. King, because he wants to know, will your organization be able to participate with us, one, on the Poor People's March, and further to participate on a broader round table the broad round table he wanted would involve 100, maybe 200 different organizational groups. And we wanted to work together on a consistent basis so we can begin to outline and hammer out a practical economic goal objective for African-American people and people of color in the United States of America. I says, yes, Dr. Abernathy. Yes, we will be happy and great and glad to do that. And we will be part of that. I'm just saying that power structure killed and murdered Dr. King, yeah. I'm telling you, and moved at the end of that year to kill us because we emerged as a profound political revolutionary, but yet political revolutionary standing up for constitutional democratic civil human rights. This is what we were about in my context. This is where we came from. And we meant it. And we told him, you come and you're shooting at us, we're gonna defend ourselves because we're shooting back, I'm sorry. We're not gonna let you lynch and murder us and kill us without us defending ourselves. But I'm just saying, I could be on, going, going, going here for a long time. Wait a minute, listen to me. I want you to support me in the producing of my film. I created my own company for this film so we get the whole story right. It's gonna be an independent film production, but it's gonna be a major top flight film production. So when we get through here, you come over to my table and I'll talk to you some more. Power to the people, and let's get on with the program. All right. I want to thank Brother Seal. All right. So just as powerfully, we've been joined uh, by one of Brother Seal's comrades and someone who was an organizer and a leader 
of the Black Panther Party here in Oakland. Uh, as uh, Sister Barbara Lee mentioned, she also ran for office, was in charge of food programs and legal services programs and other things that the party was doing. She's a writer. She's produced a book, uh, Taste of Power, is currently writing a book for reasons of race and belief, The Trials of Jam Jamil Alameen, uh, otherwise known as H. Rap Brown. So please welcome Sister Elaine Brown. Okay, thank you very much. I certainly want everyone to know that I was one of those people Bobby was talking about who joined the Black Panther Party uh, in Southern California, one of the first chapters that we had right in 19, the early part of 1968. And uh, as Bobby was just saying, um, speaking of Dr. King, of course, when he laid out his agenda in 1967, designing the Poor People's Campaign, he made a speech that really resonates here because the theme here is where do we go from here, basically. And Dr. King said in uh, August of 1967, in order for us to know where we go from here, because there, the Civil Rights Act of 64 and the Voting Rights Act of 65 had just been passed. And uh, so the question was, where do we go from here? And uh, Dr. King said, well, the first thing we have to do is assess where we are. And he said, and I'm quoting, he said, where we are now is of the good things of life, the Negro or the black has approximately half those of whites. And of the bad things, he has twice those of whites. So if we ask the question in 2013, where do we go from here, then we have to assess where black people are today. We are 25% of America's poor, even though we're only 13% of the total population. We have the highest unemployment rate we have the lowest income, median income rates. Uh, the black owned businesses represent less than 1% of all business revenues in America. Less than 50% of black households own homes. We have the highest rate of homelessness. Half the percentage of blacks have college degrees as whites. We have the highest percentage without health insurance. We have the highest infant mortality rate, maternal mortality rate, breast cancer death rate, and certainly the prostate cancer death rate. And I don't want to talk about the police murders and assaults that are ongoing. So that when Bobby and Huey formed the Black Panther Party, there was a case in Richmond, California. The murder of Denzel Dowell is no different than the murder of Oscar Grant some 40 years later. And we are living under the same uh, police state that we were uh, back in 1966. <laughs> Finally, black people represent 50% of the prison population in this country. And this country has the highest prison population of any country in the world, period, including big places like China, Russia, and so forth. So the question is, why is this true? Something wrong with black people? Basically, we're criminals, too stupid to go to school, uh, don't want to work and make any money, and too lazy to get a good job. Is something basically wrong with us? Because that is the way we have, where we have come to in this so-called neo neoliberal age, where people are asking questions like, what's wrong with black men that we're not good fathers? What's wrong with these lazy black girls that want to have babies out of wedlock? And we have gotten to a place where we have started to think that we actually have uh, delivered these wounds to ourselves, so-called self-inflicted wounds. There is absolutely nothing wrong with black people. There's something wrong with the scheme of things in America. Outside of this country, right now, in the continent that we came from, this government has currently just placed yesterday a series of drones and a base for drones in Niger. We are moving into Mali. The AFRICOM has been resurrected, which is the African command of the United States government. For what purpose we have to ask that? So when we look at the wars without end, when we look at the murders in Africa that are going on, perpetrated by this government, supported the murder of uh, Omar, Muammar Gaddafi, for example, who was really the champion of the African Union, when we look at all of what is going on, we have to ask ourselves, how did this happen? Now, we've reached a point in America today well, we don't even like to say black, and we're in a debate about should we be African Americans or should we be black people? <laughs> you know, it's like African Americans, too many syllables for me. Black is a political condition, and now I'm a black person in America. So the bottom line for me is we are assessing ourselves in a situation where we are as uh, bad off today, if not worse, because we don't even recognize we have a problem. 
We don't even want to say black. We don't want to say poor people. We talk about the middle class as though there's no poor people in America. I don't know who the middle class is. Everybody is one check away from being in the hood if you're not already in the hood. So the question of where do we go from here has to be looked at. And when we look at the history that Bobby Seale laid out of the Black Panther Party, when we look at that history, we can get some lessons, particularly here in the Bay Area, in, in Oakland. And what those lessons are is something that Dr. King said generally at, when he was organizing the Poor People's Campaign. Dr. King said that if this country can wage war with billions of dollars to kill people that never called us nigger, then we ought to be able to take some of those billions and bring them back home and give us either a job or guaranteed income. That's what King said. King had become a revolutionary by that time, even though people want to make him a two-dimensional character of himself. I note, by the way, that King seems to be getting lighter and lighter in all the pictures of him. You know, like every year he seems to be getting lighter. I'm trying to figure out if by 100 years from now he might have been, uh, end up looking like a white woman. But the bottom line is, what King says, and I want to quote this in closing my remarks so then we can have a dialogue, I want to just quote what he says at the end of his speech about the Poor People's Campaign. He says, the movement must address itself to the question of restructuring the whole of American society. There are 40 million poor people in America, and we have to ask why. And when you ask why, you have to begin to question the capitalist economy. This is the mouth of Dr. Martin Luther King. We begin to ask questions about the whole society. Now, when I say questioning the whole society, it means ultimately coming to see that the problem of racism, the problem of economic exploitation, and the problem of war are all tied together. We are dealing with issues that cannot be resolved without the nation undergoing a radical redistribution of economic power. So then I want to just say the last thing that he said because I think that people have misunderstood. I think what Bobby showed, the connection between the Black Panther Party and Dr. King, there's some notion that we were militant and he was nonviolent or something like that, but we supported of this program because Dr. King was a great man and the Black Panther Party carried an agenda that was essentially the same, which is why both were targeted by the FBI. But what the th Dr. King said, is he said, he, because he was a, a, a religious leader, he said he quotes from the Bible and he says, one day a juror came to Jesus and he wanted to know what he could do to be saved and Jesus didn't get bogged down on the kind of isolated approach of what you shouldn't do, stop lying, stop cheating. Jesus realized something basic, that if a man will lie, he will steal, if a man will steal, he will kill. So Jesus looked at him and said, no, Nicodemus, you must be born again. In other words, you can't be saved. He says, so in other words, America's whole structure must be changed. A nation that will keep people in slavery for 244 years is a nation that will exploit them and poor people generally economic. And a nation that will exploit economically will have to have foreign investments and everything else and it will have to use its military might to protect them. What I'm saying today, Dr. King said, is that we have to say to America, America, you must be born again. So there has to be a fundamental revolutionary transformation if we ever want to get out of the morass that we're in today. Thanks a lot. All right, Sister Elaine Brown. Yeah. So I want to pose a question to our panel, and then we're going to open this up for uh, questions. And as Sister Brown says, get into a dialogue uh, with each other. Now, the three of you have laid out, you know, some of our history. You've talked about the conditions that are facing our people, and we will stipulate that we're not doing well in terms of education, health care, housing, wealth inequality. So we're clear on the diagnosis. I'm going to treat you all as, as physicians this morning. When you go to your doctor, you know something's hurting. Your doctor puts a name on it with that diagnosis. But I'm more interested in, your, in the doctor's prescription. What's the medicine? How do we be born again, as you say? And I like that, that language, that renaissance. And, and as an African person, because I'm pretty clear that, you know, it's, I'm, I'm two syllables, African. <laughs> because we as African people, as people of African descent, that's who we are. As my friend Arnold Perkins would say, we're American Africans. We got Senegalese Africans, Chicago Africans, Jamaica Africans, just be African. And that helps us connect ourselves to the global connection, which is part of that rebirth. So the first question has to do with education. We're in an education institution here at Laney College. We know Mary College was a home, uh, in many ways, intellectually for the Black Panther Party and many other progressive movements, what Siri Brown is doing as the African American Studies Director. I want to ask you about education. And when you respond, I'd like you to respond in two ways. 
what is the thing we need to do internal to our community, and what's the advocacy we need to do external to our community? So for example, Ileomade School's been around for 30 years. The Wolsey community started the school 26 years ago. We, can only, we are only educating about 100 of our kids a year, though. Oakland Unified has 17,000 of our children. So I'm interested in your views on how do we begin to have that rebirth in terms of education, both internal to what we do in our community and external. I'm going to start with Jay, and we're going to come all the way down the line. Brother Jay. So I think um, some people are already doing it. Um, I met a brother today who's uh, mentoring young people and working with young people and getting them these uh, real life experiences. I think we have to connect internally. We have to connect education to opportunity and jobs. Um, for young people, and I, I'm a father of four children, young people can't think that long, long, long term. That's not how they think. They think in fairly short term. And so you tell them you need to spend half of your life for them the next four years or a third of your life the next four years doing something so you can have something, that just don't make no sense. And so if we can connect it to something right away, an internship, a paid internship, somewhere they can see how this turns into something in a real way, I think that's important. And then I think that we have to, I think we have to engage in governance of education. We have to come at education and everything, not just as consumers. I think one of the challenges is we, We've been brainwashed because of all the advertising to come at things primarily from a framework of consuming. So if I don't like my child's school, I, I go and I pick another school where we can consume education because I think it's a better school, but it's based on governing. And we have to like impose that they're going to educate our children well and what those standards are and then hold them accountable to meeting it. Now give it up.